Today we're going to talk about Master Guo Lingying's original Tai Chi form, sometimes commonly referred to as Guan Ping Tai Chi. Sifu himself never called his form Guan Ping Tai Chi. He only referred to it as Tai Chi, and we used to hear him when he says Da Tai Chi, which means practice your Tai Chi. The term Guan Ping is a generic term that refers to um, the, the style in general, including the various uh, branches of lineage that came down through Master Go. But uh, I like to use the term original Tai Chi form to refer to the Tai Chi that uh, Sifu taught in Corsa Square from 1967 until his uh, passing in the mid 80s. Um, and as to distinguish it, because there are some variations in the interpretation of the form through the various branches. Originally, the uh, form, the style, is, uh, well, in order to understand um, kind of the form, you have to kind of look at the past history uh, through the, the uh, time that it was uh, taught, rather than through the perception of the modern lens. Today, we can go on the internet and do research and find a lot of information about Tai Chi. But in those days, the world was pretty small, and all we knew that it was a different form than the usual, typical, traditional Yang style. We knew that it was Yang style. And I remember thinking, uh, knowing that it came from the second son, Yang Danhao. So um, at that point in history, in Chinatown, um, Master Choi Kaiman was uh, teaching at the YMCA and he was teaching a more traditional form. So that's pretty much the only thing that we could compare it to. Um, at that point, Chen style Tai Chi had not really come to America, it was just in China. But Chen didn't come to about the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So we really didn't know that much about it, and you know, really, we were just so uh, fascinated with Sifu and his uh, Tai Chi that we just didn't really pay much attention to it. So the style comes from the second son of uh, Yang Lu Chan. So the lineage is Yang Lu Chan uh, taught his son Yang Ban Hao, and Yang Ban Hao uh, taught was uh, employed to teach the imperial court, the Manchu court. Um, and supposedly, the story goes, one of the stable boys, uh, Wang Jiaoyi, saw Yang Banhao practicing and copied him. And Yang Banhao found Wang Jiaoyi practicing his Tai Chi and eventually taught Wang Jiaoyi. And Sifu uh, started with Shaolin when he was 13, and eventually, when he was about, I think, 25. Uh, found Wang Jiaoyi, who was in, I think, a, a very old age at that point, and studied with Wang Jiaoyi. So the lineage comes uh, Yang Lu Chan, and then Yang Ban Hao, and then Wang Jiaoyi, and then Wu Lingying, and then uh, me. The term Guan Ping Tai Chi didn't come around till around 1997. So what happened was after Sifu's passing, uh, many students would gather in Portsmouth Square annually to celebrate his Tai Chi. And eventually um, they formed an association, the Guanting Association, to uh, celebrate and uh, carry on um, memory of his uh, practice. So um, in around 1997, they decided to try to name the association and name his Kung Fu style, his Tai Chi style. And I believe it was uh, Simu and Bing Gong, Henry Luke, and some of Peter Guok's students that came up with the name Guan Ping after the village that it all started. And that's how the name Guan Ping became associated with uh, Sifu's Tai Chi. And again, Sifu uh, never having Called it that, I prefer to call it uh, Master Guo's uh, Guo Lingying's original Tai Chi, but 
sensing uh, the YouTube channel algorithms, more people will be doing a search on Guan Ping Tai Chi um, than I uh, have come to accept the use the term Guan Ping as a part of the um, uh, used term for the Tai Chi. So it's kind of an interchangeable um, master boarding game with the original Tai Chi and Guan Ping Tai Chi, but again, being more specific. And just like recently, a student uh, follower um, said that uh, they did uh, Guan Ping Tai Chi and then had to ask them what branch they came from because there was the difference in their uh, their style and form, so I could kind of understand where they were coming from. So in my consideration, it would be better if the terms were that people would address their Tai Chi as uh, Peter Guok Tai Chi or David Chin Tai Chi, Henry Luke Tai Chi, um, so that we know which branch of the lineage it comes from instead of just a generic term, Guan Ping Tai Chi. Sifu himself uh, didn't really um, exhibit his uh, Tai Chi very much at all. We do have some very rare footage that we've uh, seen that I presented of uh, Sifu and Simu doing their uh, Tai Chi. And so we do have an idea of what his uh, Tai Chi, actually his own personal Tai Chi look like. And of course, uh, what he taught all those years in Portion Square, the form that he taught and had us do right in front of him. We have to assume that that was the Tai Chi that he wanted to carry on as part of his legacy. Um, so that's something that we have to go uh, from. I don't think every, anybody ever saw him do a complete set of Tai Chi. Um, that's kind of an interesting um, fact. Um, but we did catch a glimpse, and of course, he would come and correct, and then he could show us, uh, you know, the correct way to do it. So we do have that to go on. And of course, we have the book that he uh, published in Taiwan showing the moves and the, uh, the corresponding moves. And in that video I did of the uh, uh, Tai Chi form and the name, where I correlated the names to the moves, and you can kind of compare that to the moves in the book. So we do have that to go by in terms of how original the Tai Chi form was. And we do know that um, Master Guo Siku made a vow never to change the form. So, and that's uh, something that Simu kind of uh, expressed over and over. So um, we just have to take it that this is the original form that he learned from Wang, Wang Jiaoyi. And I don't think that Wang Jiaoyi had too many other students, so we don't really have anything else from here. And that's one of the things that makes this uh, kind of a distinct style of the young tradition in that uh, it's a very small lineage that it comes through, um, again, Yang Ban Hao to Wang Jiaoyi to Sifu, um, to, we don't have really that much to compare to. As a style, there's certain things in the style that uh, kind of make it stand out um, compared to uh, the traditional Yang style that we normally see. Uh, many people consider it kind of a harder style. The moves are much more linear um, in their expression. Guan Ping style very from the traditional Yang style in uh, very, some very distinct uh, ways. It's uh, considered a more expansive, extended, um, kind of hard style compared to the, some of the more traditional softer Yang. And again, uh, at that point, there was no uh, Ten Tai Chi hadn't been brought to the US. And so uh, there was, I think, Wu and Sun and its various uh, variations of the Yang style. In the Guan Ping, um, what's kind of distinctive about it, well, some people say that it's a kind of a blend between Chen and Yang. And when they mean that, uh, in Chen, it is uh, familiar with the Chen style Tai Chi, which is very original style, very low. 
And in the Guan Ping, um, it has lower stances than traditional yang and what people consider more uh, double weighted. So you're weighted between the two legs rather than one leg forward and back. So um, the distinctive uh, single whip that we see in the Guan Ping, the arm is uh, fully extended. And uh, again, as I mentioned in uh, some other videos, Sifu preferred not to have the pinching fingers, but the open fingers. And if you watch uh, some of the videos of uh, Sifu doing his uh, Tai Chi in Portia School, you'll see that he does the single work uh, pretty much just like that. Again, the lower horse. And in um, the Quan Ping, the knees are never supposed to extend past the uh, vertical. So you never see a horse that's like this, but the horse is supposed to be kind of a inverted U, use it to the ground. And the transfer of weight is much more centered in many uh, traditional young styles, uh, supposedly for more rooted uh, power. Uh, another characteristic of uh, the Guan Ping uh, Tai Chi is uh, many of the moves are repeated. Uh, again, there's even a whole section repeated within the form. Um, and so like, uh, for example, in Repulse Monkey, which is a repeated section or move, um, there's no set amount of the repeat, so you can vary um, the amount of uh, times that you do it. And so this allows the form to be fairly expansive in that you can cover a large area and you can kind of alter the form a little bit, kind of like uh, to fit the space. Um, and as I presented in another video where I did the uh, one thing Tai Chi on a four by six uh, rug, um, you can kind of alter the form in order to fit a small space as well. It would be very uh, footwork a little bit in terms of like uh, changing the footwork so that you're still in the space. Um, so this uh, key, the stance, the horse stance, also the uh, footwork is uh, different in that we form a T or an L. So this foot is facing this way and this foot is facing this way and that gives a uh, much more stability in terms of this direction and this direction and uh, that means that uh, in order to accomplish certain moves you have to turn the waist more here and and also in um the this style of tai chi the arms tend to be extended more. So when we do a push, we're sitting down and extending the arms more than many styles where they keep the hand in here. Another one of the characteristics of the Guan Qi Tai Chi uh, in similarities with uh, Chen style Tai Chi is that uh, occasionally there would be exhibitions of Fa Jin, explosive power, um, in many uh, softer young styles they uh, don't show that. And so, for example, in uh, these moves here, these are done a little more explosively, as well as Tiger with Bo, uh, more expression of power coming from the root. Sifu only taught one form, the original Tai Chi form. Uh, as far as I know, there was no application form. Uh, it was, he didn't have a uh, small frame, large frame. Uh, he didn't have a slow set, fast set. Um, and um, in some of the other branches, they have uh, kind of come up with a short form and long form, but people only have one form, no short form, no long form, no small frame, no large frame, just uh, the Tai Chi. In the Tai Chi curriculum, 
of uh, Master Gold, um, I kind of came to the conclusion that there's four pillars uh, of four uh, pillars of physical practice because uh, I'm not including the philosophy into this uh, the this aspect. Um, and the four pillars are his uh, stretching, and the stretching was uh, very important in terms of his tai chi and also the Shaolin. He didn't like to make any difference in um, teaching between Tai Chi and Shaolin. He taught basically the same philosophy, the same stretching, the same standing meditation for all the students. So he was considered basically the Shaolin as the foundation. And then if you only do the Tai Chi, then you kind of, you know, did the Tai Chi only. But he really didn't separate that much between the Shaolin and the Tai Chi. And also another distinct part of his uh, Guan Ping style is the straight leg kicks that he does in his Tai Chi and the falling stance that he does, which I don't know if the carryover from his Shaolin or something that Wang Xiaoyi taught, but um, in some of the moves, uh, we do the slow falling stance. And uh, that's uh, something that's uh, common to both the Shaolin and the Tai Chi. And I did do a video of similarities to uh, Shaolin and Tai Chi, but here we're just talking about the, uh, the Tai Chi itself. And um, so uh, in the four pillars that I'm talking about, uh, I would say that stretching was one of the four pillars because you really emphasize stretching. And of course, uh, the story is that in order to study with Wang Jiaoyi, he had to do chin to toe, the chin to toe stretch in 100 days. And um, Sifu himself uh, really emphasized the chin to toe. I think in Sifu's eyes, you weren't very, um, you weren't a dedicated student. This is just my daughter again. <laughs> oh, nine o'clock <laughs> which is uh, morning feeding time i don't think sifu uh, took it very seriously in fact you couldn't learn certain forms unless you could do chin to toe so sifu um, being very old school in the teaching methods was really adamant about people getting up early in the morning to practice, you know, five o'clock in the morning and doing chin to toe. And so um, that was he, that carryover from him studying with Wang Jiaoyi in order to uh, learn, he had to do it. And so he kind of encouraged his students to do it. And it's kind of been a lost tradition now. Most teachers don't uh, require or even teach chin to toe too much anymore. But the stretching is part of the pillars because in order to do this more expansive style of uh, Tai Chi, um, it, it, it does take a little bit more flexibility so that as you do the moves, you can be, still continue to be fluid while being lower and uh, moving from move to move and doing the kick. Just having more flexibility allows you to be softer when you're doing the move. So I think uh, stretching, and I presented to, uh, his basic stretching in one video as part of that effort to continue the legacy of the, the pillars. Um, the other um, second pillar was the standing meditation. And Sifu taught uh, just one pose in the standing meditation, which was uh, the universal pose, we called it. And again, you can change right to left. And you'll see in many of the videos, even before we did the uh, Cha Kwan, Sha, Northern Shaolin form, he had this really in the universal pose. So he didn't really separate um, standing meditation as an internal uh, development only for internal students like Tai Chi or Bakwa or uh, Xing Yi, but uh, he considered it necessary for just the whole curriculum. And so that's one of his other pillars, uh, um, standing meditation. 
And also he himself at that point when we were studying him was deeply into Ichuan. Ichuan being kind of like more internal, just uh, kind of free form. And so um, understanding meditation is a very, very important part of the pillar of the Tai Chi uh, curriculum. Uh, of course, the fixed form, the Dalu, Dalu is a Wushu term for like a pre-rehearsed form. And I use it kind of uh, interchangeably between fixed form, form, and Dalu. Uh, it's, uh, again, the main pillar uh, for people to practice in. I always emphasize that it's important in the form. The form, my feeling is the form is just the beginning point and uh, I always thought that Tipu's uh, form, the style of the Guantin style was kind of blocky and kind of not as pretty as some of the softer, um, you know, young Tai Chi. And, but um, eh, after years and years of kind of like practicing it and kind of begrudgingly, sometimes I've been kind of like frustrated with how awkward it looked or blocky it looked. I became to accept it and really, even though I'd like studied some Yang style and some Wu style and some Chen style in order to uh, be able to enhance my Quan Ting style, um, I really started to appreciate the Guan Ting for what it was. And um, in its uh, blocky structure, the way that Shifu taught it, I started to appreciate what it was for how he taught it. To me, um, I want to kind of give this comparison to what I think about the, the hardness and the softness of your development of a form. It's like when you look at a boulder in the stream and it's a beautifully washed rock. And uh, it took years for the flow of that water, which is like your practice, to go over that rock and kind of smooth it out until it was rounded. And, but it started off possibly as a broken chunk of granite that was pretty square. And that's what uh, this kind of blocky style of Tai Chi is like. It gives you kind of a start off with this kind of square structure so that you be sure that you touch all the corners of that expansiveness. But eventually as you come to an understanding of it, you learn how to find that roundness within the square. Um, kind of like the idea that within every square there's a circle, and then within every circle is a square. And so that's kind of the way uh, I look at it. And then another time I came up with the idea that what Tishu gave us was like a bone, the bones of Tai Chi. And just like a, the skeleton is very awkward looking and square and blocky. After you have an understanding of your Tai Chi and you have a maturity, it's like putting body onto that skeleton. And so there's kind of some um, kind of uh, form, shape and form to that skeleton that Tifu gave. Um, he did not teach uh, application per se in terms of kind of explaining the function of forms. I think he left it up to you on your journey to discover uh, the meaning of the Tai Chi and its function and I kind of believe that uh, that is also valuable and that when you discover something on your own it's much more important than it somebody shows it to you. Um, but he was not hesitant in, in seeing you do a move to come over occasionally and show you the function of the move and uh, you go flying, you know, because you like, and he wouldn't show it more than a few times. And that was just how Sifu was. He, he was old school. If he showed you once, he showed you twice, that was it. And he would have to wait until, you know, you could see it again. And Myself, I only came down to Portion Square on the weekend during the mid portion where I studied. So I was always eager to learn. So when I saw Sifu showing somebody something, I just went over and uh, tried to pick up on it too. So a lot of my knowledge of the 
function of moves comes from this uh, sporadic interactions with Siku and, um, you know, kind of uh, seeing how you would apply the moves and, you know, kind of show you the function. And the fourth pillar uh, that we will actually go into and more extensively in other videos would be uh, pushing hand toy show. And uh, in pushing hand, Siku taught only single hand pushing. And that was the essence of, uh, basically that was the essence of learning the function, learning how to apply the moves out of pushing hands, play show. When I first uh, started studying at the studio uh, around 1967, I was going to art school. And so I was able to go to the studio fairly regularly, just about every day. And in the uh, evenings, uh, when I would go, there uh, would be like uh, some people in uh, pushing hands. And people uh, would always choose the partner that you would have to do play show with. You would like to um, kind of partner you up with people to enhance your learning. And there was this Chinese guy, his name was uh, Chris. And Siku always would partner me, partner me up with Chris because Siku knew that I come from uh, Kempo and that I like to kind of, you know, uh, spar and fight. And so he partnered me up with uh, Chris and we would do pretty much free form pushing. It was up to you, you know, when there wasn't like a lot of teaching about what to do, you just try to apply the moves out of the uh, toy show, the pushing hand, and then uh, Siku would come and show you and show you. Uh, I did have occasion to kind of push with Siku a few times just for him to show me, this, you know, some things that he wanted to show me. And um, the best way to describe Siku was he was solid. He wasn't soft. I wouldn't say he was like uh, soft and yielding, but uh, of course he was like he was, had the ability to yield. But it would be like uh, pushing a horse. That's the best way to describe it. You ever push the large animal, and the animal has give, but it's solid. Uh, that's what people was like in uh, kind of like a close um, touching. So uh, the four pillars uh, then would be the stretching, the standing meditation, the dalu, and uh, the toy show. And so I'll be covering in the future uh, more about the Dalu, and I'll, I'll be teaching the six forms, and we'll be going over the moves much more extensively. But in this video, I just wanted to give you kind of a brief synopsis of kind of the background of the Guan Ping Tai Chi, uh, Siku's original Tai Chi form, and also kind of some tidbits about it, and a little bit about the style of uh, uh, Siku's teaching. I think in another video I'll get much more into kind of Siku's uh, teaching style and what it was like uh, studying with him in Portia Square. But for the purposes of this video, um, um, I'm just kind of touching briefly on a lot of uh, things to kind of get people acquainted about the characteristics of um, his original Tai Chi form. And I'd like to talk about one more thing while I'm covering um, the Guan Ping Tai Chi is the idea of uh, variations of the form, whether or not you should uh, stick strictly to the form itself. I will talk more about this as we get into uh, the Guan Ping form and uh, itself. But I feel that um, as somebody that has been granted uh, permission by Siku himself to teach, I think it's very, very important not to put your personal style into teaching the form. In other words, you, you come to your own understanding of the form and you might change it, round it a little bit, um, kind of put more emphasis on one thing or another, have little kind of inflections of personal style that you put into it. And that's uh, perfectly fine because I think it's... Uh, Part of the journey is to discover your own understanding of the form. But as a teacher, I think it's very important to carry on the traditional as clean as you can. Try to preserve exactly how people taught it to me and uh, as I would teach it to you. 
so in the future, when I teach the form, I will be trying to preserve that exact methodology and uh, kind of structure that Sutra taught to me and uh, try as little as possible to put my influence into a way. I might explain how I've come to understand that move and how I've kind of changed the way that I do the form from basically the more structured uh, form um, when it comes because I do have my own personal way that I do it. And again, you know, you'll find that there's no one way that you want to do the form. You like to do the form different ways, you know, as you're expressing different uh, parts of your understanding. But again, to preserve the form as tradition, it's very important to keep it as intact as possible without uh, influencing it. Um, in the form itself, uh, if you watch people doing demonstrations and they do, you know, the, the form itself takes to be done fast or slow. It would take anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes if you do it very long and slow. But of course, if you give a demonstration and people are going to sit there and watch like a two minute performance, you have to be abbreviate the form, change it or something like that. Um, that's just to give a flavor of the form, but not the form itself. It's just presenting the form in its entirety to, to preserve tradition. Then it's up to you to do your best job at presenting the form uh, as it was taught. So um, that's just kind of my personal feeling about uh, the traditional form versus the own kind of interpretation of the form to carry through uh, as the lineages go on. Um, in classical tradition, uh, forms are usually taught in a uh, rote format, which means that the teacher shows you without very much explanation, and then the student follows. And then, uh, as the lineage uh, proceeds, uh, generation after generation, it's kind of like the game telephone, where it can degrade from the original message. And so, again, I think it's uh, very important, especially since uh, I'm such a direct student of Sutra to try to carry on uh, the lineage and as close to what Sutra taught as possible. So that's what I'll pre be presenting in the future when I teach uh, this uh, original Tai Chi forms.